from the studios of Farm Journal Broadcast. Coming up on Ag Day, one of our biggest beef customers could make shipments much more attractive. WTL expresses concerns about a trade war. An eye for an eye will leave us all blind and the world in deep recession. An agribusiness looking beyond the seasons. But when the sun, solar radiation is down, mm. every, all the weather variables get turned upside down. And raising cane, a sometimes hot and exciting job of raising sugar cane. Ag Day, brought to you by the Chevy Silverado, the most dependable, longest lasting full-size pickups on the road. Good morning, I'm Clinton Griffiths. U.S. beef may get more competitive in one of its biggest markets. Japanese tariffs could be moving lower soon, according to trade officials here at home. Japan maintaining a large appetite for U.S. beef products, as shown in the latest numbers from the U.S. Meat Export Federation in their January report. In January, the exports increased 7% from a year ago in volume and 19% in value. But that could go even higher. Japan expected to lift its additional safeguard tariffs on U.S. frozen beef shipments at the end of the month. That drops the current 50% tariff back down to 38.5%. USMEF says the change will make the U.S. more competitive with other countries once it's lifted. But it's still not as low as Australia's tariff with Japan. Uh, we still face a tariff advantage, a tariff disadvantage in Japan when it, uh, compared to Australian beef. Uh, but exports are going well there. We feel we can somewhat deal with that tariff gap as it is, but we certainly don't want to experience that 50% tariff again anytime soon. Ted McKinney, USDA Undersecretary for Trade and Foreign Agricultural Affairs, says he has reassurances from Japan following a trade visit to the country late last week. McKinney telling reporters the safeguard tariffs were brought up and the Japanese alluding to taking off those tariffs at the end of the month as expected. Now, McKinney saying, quote, I guess we'll see, but at this point, they're an honorable people, and I'd be very disappointed if it didn't get lifted, end quote. However, he says Japan reiterating the U.S. brand and that they'd prefer to, that we rejoin the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement. But certainly we did hear that they would love for us to come back into the fold in some way. Their preference is TPP, and I think we all agreed there's going to have to be some time that settles. Perhaps not too much time, but some time that settles. McKinney says the tariffs on aluminum and steel products did not come up in any formal discussions. Now, Secretary of State Rex Tillerson says he'd like to see a study on how the new CPTPP will affect the U.S. now that the remaining members of the original group officially implemented the pact last week in Santiago, Chile. Tillerson emphasizing a need for fairness and reciprocity in expanding trade relationships with those TPP countries. Ag groups like the wheat growers say the threat to market share is significant, especially in places like Japan. Once they sign TPP and once the first six countries change their uh, domestic laws to comply, TPP goes into, agree into action. Canada and Australia tariffs on wheat start to drop. And we will eventually, the U.S. in the first year will be about a $65, uh, $65 uh, uh, disadvantage per metric ton of wheat. Roughly about 500 million in the first year. We're looking at billions uh, by 2028 that the U.S. market will lose by not being a member. Gould says wheat industry leaders traveled to Japan earlier in 2018. When asked about a bilateral agreement, they say the response was clear. The Japanese government was very clear they are not interested in a bilateral agreement. They told our uh, U.S. Wheat Associates uh, friends that we need to do everything we can to rejoin TPP. Gould says the message has been sent in a letter to the president. He believes the U.S. has lost some of its leverage and ability to negotiate since it left the Trans-Pacific Partnership. The European Commission is seeking talks with the World Trade Organization as well as with the United States with regard to the U.S. decision to impose tariffs on aluminum and steel imports. Now, for the time being, the EU, Germany, and Japan are hoping to get an exemption to new metal tariffs. The three sides met on Saturday in Brussels as part of a trilateral effort to combat unfair trade practices. Now, the EU followed up by saying there was no immediate clarity on the exact U.S. procedure for exemptions. President Trump tweeting Monday that Commerce Secretary Wilbur Ross will be talking to the European Union about European tariffs that Trump argues have been unfair to the United States, farmers, and manufacturers. 
The World Trade Organization is sticking by its concerns that President Trump's announcement of U.S. steel and aluminum tariffs could trigger an escalation of trade barriers around the world, ultimately driving the global economy toward recession. A WTO spokesman saying Friday that the trade body doesn't have a specific reaction to Trump's announcement, but he reiterated concerns expressed earlier in the time, week by WTO Director General this. Roberto yeah, Azevedo, the DG calling on all sides to think hard about the consequences. Once we start down this path, the DG told members, it will be very difficult to reverse direction. An eye for an eye will leave us all blind and the world in deep recession. We must, we must make every effort to avoid the fall of the first dominoes. The WTO is designed to help facilitate fair and free trade. It's been in existence since January 1st of 1995. The spokesperson says the next move is in the hands point, of WTO member states that may decide to use mechanisms such as the dispute settlement processes to challenge President Trump's decision to impose the tariffs. Meanwhile, the president is scheduled to visit the U.S.-Mexico border today. He will inspect 30-foot-high prototypes for a future border wall that were built in San Diego last fall. The wall was a centerpiece of his campaign. Now, farmers in California's Imperial Valley still rely on hundreds of Mexicans who cross the border daily to pick vegetables. Jack Vesey farms about 10,000 acres in the California town of Calexico, just across the border from Mexicali. He says daily commuters from Mexico account for half of his workforce. He's been to Washington numerous times this past 10 years to talk immigration reform, but he doesn't see any change. From one administration to the other, we, we just haven't really seen much of a difference. There's a lot more rhetoric coming out in regards to immigration and a lot more talk about it, but in regards to agriculture, they're very quiet, not much said, but there's a lot of gentlemen that, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I look up to trying to work very hard on this issue to make sure that we're able to survive. VC figures 10% of Congress embraces open immigration policies, another 10% oppose them, and the other 80% don't want to touch it because their voters are too divided. Mike Hoffman is back with us today, and he joins us for today's Corrupt Comments. Good morning, Mike. Good morning, Clinton. Let's start off in southeastern South Dakota. Calving season is officially underway for Betsy Jimmons' dad on his operation, and his first calves are twins. South Dakota is getting spoiled with weather for March. Highs are in the 40s and may linger up into the 50s by midweek. Now we'll talk about cattle way on the other side of the globe. Don Rose with U.S. Commodities traveled to New Zealand where it's currently fall. Don says the silage is being cut, pastures are green, and the crops at this point look good. Now let's take a look at the uh, wind speed forecast. You can see it's basically uh, northeast and mid-Atlantic coast back into the Great Lakes. There will be some wind in the far west as well, as you can see, especially as we head into the afternoon. Still pretty breezy across the uh, middle Mississippi Valley and Ohio Valleys. For the day tomorrow, then very windy in Maine, at least to uh, start the day and overnight. And we'll see those winds increase once again in eastern lakes, mid-Atlantic, and especially in the western states, uh, Utah, and uh, taking a look at Arizona, Southern California, getting awfully windy tomorrow. We'll uh, take a look at your forecast coming up, but first here are some hometown temps. Save time each day and receive the latest market prices directly to your cell phone with market updates. It makes it effortless to stay aware of shifting market prices. Just text MARKETS8 to 31313 to get started. What does sunspot potentially mean for crop yields? We'll ask that question and why you should care coming up in analysis. And later, the sweet success of sugarcane farming in South Texas. Ag Day, brought to you by New Delaro Fungicide for corn and soybeans. Achieve personal best yields. Sean Hackett, Hackett Financial Advisors here, uh, talking about some of the Maybe some of the outside issues that could end up affecting agriculture a little bit longer term. Uh, and, and, and this is kind of a, one of those things that we don't always talk about, Sean. Well, what, one of the big road waves we see potentially coming over the next five years is the reduction of sunspots that we see right now. In now fact, explain that. Why? Why is that a big deal? Well, every 200 years, the sun goes quiet. And normally, there's a very consistent solar radiation hits the earth and it causes a certain amount of weather volatility that's reasonable and the world can grow plenty of food within the confines. But when the sun, solar radiation is down, mm. every, all the weather va variables get turned upside down. 
and we get an expansion of weather volatility. It's like taking a magnifying glass and expanding it an order of magnitude. We've already seen a little bit of that weather already because it started in the fourth quarter. Drought in Argentina, drought in the U.S., floods in France. I mean, things are happening that haven't happened in a long time. It's just the beginning. And we, the research we have done says that during the troughs, which we're in now, which is a five-year trough that we're heading into, is where the greatest weather volatility occurs and where the greatest impact of global yields occurs. We have data that goes back to the 1600s and 1800s from ice core samples, tree rings, and from actually written testimony of the kind of problems that they had in, in produced production of wheat in the UK, for example. And we think this is one of the big rogue waves that's going to come in and really, really surprise everyone who thinks we're always going to be producing more food forever. It's, I, we don't believe that's likely, at least over the next five years. Yeah, so, so what does the world look like uh, over the next five years with this reduced sunspot activity? It's, it's a world with, with food scarcity. Mm. It's a world with uh, localized famines. You know, Chinese have a billion, five, billion, six people. If they have a, a missed crop and they have a poor crop and they don't have enough food to feed themselves, who's going to supply the, f the food to the Chinese? If everyone else is also having trouble. I mean, we don't, we're, look, we're not doomist and gloomist. That's not our, our <laughs> modus operandi. However, however, it's not going to be pleasant. It's going to be a very difficult time, and we're going to have to. The technology we have today has all been centered around a normal sunspot cycle. We're going to have to come up with new ways of growing food in this more difficult environment. We will do that, sure. but it's not going to come without a, a, a crisis to begin with. Some fits and starts. Some fits and starts. Okay, Absolutely. very good. Appreciate the perspective. Is it interesting? We'll be back with more Agnet. Just a minute. For more marketing information on everything from grains to livestock to cotton and sugar, call Sean with Hackett Financial Advisors at 561-573-3766. Welcome back to Ag Day Meteorologist Mike Hoffman here at the Weather Map today. And Mike, it's really the Northeast expecting a big storm. Yeah, and that's going to be lingering too. You have more energy feeding into it with that low pressure system in the eastern lakes. But we also have another powerful storm system in the western states, and this is going to be a slow mover as it comes in, uh, really giving a lot of the west coast a fair dose of rain and mountain snows in the higher elevations anyway. So let's put the maps into motion as we head through this afternoon. The heavy snow moves on up into New England and the eastern lakes and places. Lake effect snow scattered even back into the southwestern Great Lakes and the parts of Michigan and Indiana. And you can see that storm system out west continuing to slowly come in. Heading through the uh, nighttime hours tonight, we still have this system kind of coming together in the northeast. And as we head uh, through the day tomorrow, they'll kind of merge into one uh, powerful storm so the snow continues for much of New York and New England as we head through the uh, day tomorrow. So we're talking about some pretty heavy amounts there. Another cold front then pushing down into central Florida, keeping it chilly for this time of the year and another system coming in out west. So kind of this pattern that we've gotten into going to continue. You can see the precipitation estimate past 24 hours, mainly mid-Atlantic. Adding in the next 36 hours, though, you can see lots of moisture, especially central and southern California, and especially the higher elevations. But you can also see those heavy amounts into New England and the eastern Great Lakes. <clears throat> Most of that's going to be snow in uh, the northeast. Pretty much all of it's going to be snow. And you can see summer is going to end up with uh, 10, 12 inches of snow out of this storm system. And it's still going to go beyond tomorrow afternoon. And you can see the higher elevations out west getting some more heavy snow. Taking a look at uh, high temperatures this afternoon, only in the 60s and low 70s through most of Florida, 30s and 40s though through the Great Lakes into the Ohio Valley. Low temperatures tonight going to drop into the teens and 20s in a large swath of the Corn Belt and uh, down into the 30s, even in northern portions of uh, Georgia, Alabama and Mississippi. And checking out tomorrow afternoon, still chilly in the eastern parts of the country, kind of mild through the central plains and then kind of chilly out west as well. All because of the troughs. We have one trough over the Great Lakes, one off the west coast. You can kind of see those hold for a while. Then we see the western one trying to come east, although it really doesn't make it into this ridge until sometime uh, later in the weekend and into next week. So it's going to take a little while for all of this to evolve. It's still a changing weather pattern across the country. That is a look across the country. Now let's take a look at some local forecasts. First of all, Portland, Oregon, cool, times of rain, high temperature of 52 degrees. Amarillo, Texas, partly sunny and a bit cooler, high around 54. And Columbus, Ohio, mostly cloudy, maybe an afternoon snow shower or two, high of 35. 
When we come back, a reshuffling in the milk industry has some producers looking for a new home for their milk. We'll explain next and later, we're off to the Lone Star State for a closer look at growing sugar cane. Ever wake up wondering what does today's weather have in store? Well, with weather updates, it delivers the local forecast right to your cell phone each morning to make preparing for the day easier. Just text WEATHER6 to 31313 to get started. In our dairy report, the decision by Dean Foods to end milk contracts with about 80 farms continues to ripple across the country. Milk producers in about eight states are impacted by the decision. They'll be looking for a new home for that milk on June 1st. Dean says a decline in milk consumption is behind the decision. Walmart, a major buyer of Dean's milk, is also opening its own 25,000 square foot processing center in Fort Wayne, Indiana. Now it plans to use dairy farms located within 200 miles of the plant to supply the retail giant store in Illinois, Indiana, Ohio, Michigan, and Northern Kentucky. And some of that movement in the markets driven by the latest USDA Wadsey report, the agency leaving the all milk price alone last month in a range from 1575 to 1635. It did bump class three price expectations higher on a cheese price increase and it lowered class four prices on falling non-fat dry milk prices. Now it raised the milk production forecast for this year from last month on more rapid growth in milk per cow in the first half of the year. What does sweet tea and fire have in common? Sugar cane. I'll explain coming up. In the Country, sponsored by Kubota. Tractors, hay tools, utility vehicles, mowers, and more. Visit KubotaUSA.com today. Sugarcane harvest in the Rio Grande Valley of Texas should wrap up in the next month. It's a long harvest season, five to six months long, but it's also a very long growing season. In this video provided by the Texas Farm Bureau, Ed Wolf follows the path to sweet success. The sweetest crop in Texas, sugarcane, only grown in the Rio Grande Valley. Bryce Wildey and his family are some of the few farmers left raising cane in Texas, making the state a little sweeter. I love growing sugar cane because it really is sweet. I mean, you, we can drive around on the turn row and, and cut a stalk and chew into it and, uh, and really get that sugar taste. Growing sugar is very different than Bryce's other crops, like corn and cotton. From start to finish, growing cane is the definition of unique. For example, you don't plant a seed, but a stalk, called a billet. Right here are these rings, we call them internodes. Each internode uh, ideally has a bud, if you can see the bud right here, and we'll plant that into the ground and that's where the sugar cane emerges from. It takes about 12 to 16 months for the cane to mature. Sugar cane is a retuning crop, meaning after it's harvested, the stubble is left in the ground and new growth starts. The plant can be cut and left to regrow for four or more years before needing to replant. When harvest time kicks off around October, things really start to heat up. The main reason we burn our cane is for harvest efficiency. They start burning from the perimeter and they start on the outside and they burn the whole outside with a uh, flamethrower and it goes up, a 40 acre field would go up in, in 20 to 30 minutes very fast. The fire will consume the leafy matter of the plant but not the cane which contains the sugar, leaving the field ready to cut. Safety is their primary concern plus protecting the environment by following state regulations. Within a day, harvesters are running, cutting the stalks into 8 to 12 inch billets. It's a 24 hour, 7 day a week job. Every time a buggy is filled, it's about 10 tons of sugar cane, all heading to Texas' one and only sugar mill. All that sugar cane is conveyed to the mill. They start by washing it to get all the dirt off of it, and then they go through the milling and crushing process. The mill processes about 1,000 tons of raw sugar a day. Seven large rollers take the cane stalks and separate the juice from the fiber. The fiber is used as fuel to make steam and electricity, making the mill carbon neutral. The juice is heated to create sugar crystals and backstrap molasses, eventually separating it using centrifugal force. The molasses goes to feed cattle. The raw sugar is ready to be refined into the tiny white grains that sweeten our tea and desserts. It's gratifying to be able to produce a crop that we see in restaurants and that we see on people's tables and, and stuff like that. We're really proud of that. The Rio Grande Valley climate, soil, water, and people, all perfect for growing the U.S.'s third largest supply of sugarcane. 126 farmers, 500 mill employees, all working together to make life sweet. 
with the Texas Farm Bureau, Ed Wolf, Lyford. And that's all the time we have this morning. We're sure glad you tuned in, spent part of your day with us from all of us here at Ag Day. I'm Clinton Griffiths. Have a great day out in farm country. Ag Day, brought to you by Ram Commercial, America's longest-lasting heavy-duty pickups.